Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. I want to talk about foundations. Certainly whenever, if like you're building a house or any kind of a building or structure, the foundation is the most important part. You can have an absolutely beautiful, gorgeous structure, but if it doesn't have a strong foundation, it eventually will fall and crumble. In relationships, it's important to have a strong foundation so that when the struggles of life come upon you, uh, you have those foundations to fall back upon. Same thing's true in business. Uh, any business has to have a, a strong guiding foundation principle uh, to rely upon uh, to just to, to take care of themselves during a struggling market or something like that. So foundations, it's important. But today we're going to talk about the foundation of our church. Uh, we're going to look in the scriptures today in Matthew chapter 16. It's the first time we see the actual word church mentioned in, in scriptures, in all of scriptures, first mention of it. And Jesus is the one that says it. If you have a, a red letter edition of the Bible, these words are in red. These are the words of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he was ministering to his disciples. And uh, he was talking about the foundation of the church. He was actually he was introdu introducing something new uh, to them. <clears throat> Up to this point, uh, there had been in the wilderness, of course, there was a tabernacle and then the temple and, and temple worship. And all those things were to point to Jesus, uh, who would be our substitutionary sacrifice. And so instead of sacrificing lambs and uh, for just to cover the price of sins, Jesus would offer himself as, as the lamb, the lamb of God who would die on the cross of Calvary. And uh, we're getting ready to celebrate that this Easter season. And so uh, we, they understood the idea of, of congregation, but a church, that's something new. And Jesus is, is showing how that foundation will be. And that's what we want to take a look at this morning here in Matthew uh, chapter 16. So hopefully this will be a blessing to everybody today, uh, because today that's still what we're doing. We're still building that church. Uh, that's what God is doing in this world, uh, trying to. And building a church is more than just winning souls, although that is key. It's important that we win souls, that people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, but then within within the church as well, building up uh, those people that are within the church. And uh, again, helping people to know him better, to know who God is and who Jesus is and, and who, who the Holy Spirit is and, and what these three do in our lives and in the church. And so this morning, that's what we want to take a look at here is, is the foundation of the church. And that's why I've entitled this message, Upon this rock. What does he mean by that? What is he saying? What is he telling Peter? Uh, certainly there's different ideas in the world today, but I'll share with you what I think he's trying to get across to us about building his church today. Let's go ahead and read uh, the whole text that I want to read for today. And then uh, we're going to look at just a few things this morning here in my notes. Uh, but Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13 is where I want to start. I'm going to read down to verse 20. So if you have your Bibles there, uh, that's where we want to read today. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, and some, excuse me, and others, Jeremiah, <clears throat> or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And so a few thoughts again just from this passage of scripture that I hope will be a blessing to you today. As, and as this is where we are today, we are still endeavoring to build uh, the church of God, to build it, to help it to grow physically, but also to help it to grow up. And so uh, that's what we want to take a look at this morning. Just I think I just have a few things here in my notes I want to share with you today. <clears throat> the first of all, it starts right off, and, and you know, it almost like, uh, it seems like Jesus is being a little um, proud, if you will. He says, who do people say that I am? You know, what's people's opinion? But he has a purpose for everything that he does. And it's not so much that he really cares uh, what other people think, okay? Because as God, he already knows those things. He knows our thoughts and hearts and intents and stuff like that. And so it's like he didn't, it's not like he didn't know it already. Uh, but he was trying to get a point across to Peter uh, specifically and to, excuse me, and to all his disciples as well. 
And so that's why, more importantly, not so much uh, who do others say that I am. They gave some different answers, you know, uh, John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. You know, people knew that he was something special, but so many people missed out on that, that he was the Christ, that he was the Son of God that came into this world to die on the cross. Uh, but the second question that he asked in our test is when, text is when he actually spoke directly to, to Peter. I believe he looked him right square in the eye. And he's doing the same thing to you and I today. Uh, he's looking us right in the eye. God is looking us right in the eye and saying, asking this very question, who do you say that Jesus is? And your answer to that question is important, very important. Okay. And so who today, that's the first thing we want to look at is who do you say that Jesus is? I've said this from my pulpit many a times, you know, most people today believe in God of some sort, a God of some sort. If you were uh, the last statistics that I read, and it's been a while, but the last statistics that I read said that at least 80 percent of the world's population believe in a God, uh, some higher power, some deity. So it's pretty high numbers. <clears throat> but all we have to do is look around in this world and see how much sin is prevalent in the world. And you wonder, do people truly believe in God? And so I guess more importantly, do you believe in the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the creator God, the one that created the heavens and the earth, that God? And so that's that's important that we believe in God. And, and most people, as I said, do have that belief in him. But as the old proverbial saying, where the rubber meets the road is, what do you think about Jesus? That is key. You know, who is this Jesus to you? You know, the people of, of Christ's day, you know, they thought, well, maybe he is, you know, because John the Baptist had been beheaded, and they thought maybe he was another coming of John the Baptist, or some said Elijah, in which Elijah, the Bible, we know that John the Baptist was the second coming of Elijah. He was that forerunner, that one that went before Jesus to prepare the way. And others said Jeremiah, a great prophet in the Old Testament, or maybe just one of the prophets. And so, whereas they thought he was a good guy, a great guy, a good speaker, preacher, but they didn't go so far as to actually confess, admit that he was the Christ. And as the Christ, as Messiah, that would mean that he was the very Son of God, that one that came to this world to save this world, to redeem this world, and to, to rule and reign in this world. That's what folks were looking for, is that king uh, to come and reign. They wanted a physical king. Jesus came to usher in a spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom at that time. There's coming a day. Uh, when Jesus shall return, and he will usher in the kingdom of God, a physical kingdom. And uh, he'll do away with sin and death and dying and decay and all those things, and we'll live in a virtual paradise here on this earth. And we look forward to that day, whenever that day comes. And so the question comes back to us again, who do you say that Jesus, the Son of Man, is? Who is he uh, to you today? Uh, our answer to that is very key. It's very important uh, that you understand that Jesus, and just a few things about him that the scriptures tell us, is that Jesus is that virgin-born son of God. He didn't have an earthly father. His father was God Almighty in heaven. And that's important. Now, the Bible says that the blood type of a baby, or not the Bible, excuse me, <laughs> science itself says that the blood, blood type of a child comes from the father. And uh, Jesus, as the son of God, with God as his father, his blood comes from the father. And that's important because you and I, as humans, uh, our blood is sin sick. It's sin cursed. It was cursed through Adam and Eve. And so everyone that is born of, of man uh, has that curse upon them. Where Jesus was not born of man, he was born of God, does not have that curse. And so that makes him that perfect son of God. And I suppose maybe that's a, another message for another time altogether. We can delve into that. But uh, he had a holy blood. He had a righteous blood. <clears throat> and because of that, he was able to go to the cross and not just cover up sin, but to pay for it once and for all. But the key for you and I is to confess. There's a scripture in John 6, 44. It says, no man, uh, excuse me, wrong scripture, sorry. Look at my notes wrong. Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 11, that says, uh, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's what's key, is that we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you believe today that Jesus is that virgin-born Son of God? Do you believe today that he died on the cross, that he went down to the depths of hell, that he won the victory over sin, that he rose again? that he showed himself alive, that he ascended up into the heavens, and that he's seated at the right hand of God the Father right now. And he's making intercession for you and I today. And he's offering to us the free gift of salvation, any who will confess him, repent of our sins, turn from our sins, and confess him. Call upon him as Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Will you do that today? See, that's what's important. And that's the key to all this. And so it's what Jesus was trying to get across to his disciples, to Peter, to his disciples. Uh, who do you say that I am? So we need to answer that question for ourselves today. 
<clears throat> do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? You know, do you know, can you go back in your mind and remember that day, that time, that place when you prayed and asked Christ to be your Savior? Some people might say, well, I'm a good person. I've gone to church and I believe in stuff. But just like your physical birth, there was a day that you were born. There was an actual physical day that you came into existence into this world. And we celebrate those birthdays, those physical birthdays. And today, if you're saved, you have a spiritual birthday. There was an actual day uh, that you repented of your sins and called upon the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You know, not everybody is is able to remember the exact day, date, and time and all that sort of a thing because we're not really told to, to record it. I'm thankful the preacher that led me to the Lord told me, you know, to record it. So I know that my spiritual birthday is August 18th of 1983. That's the day that I uh, repented of my sins and asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. And I know that on that day I was born again, as they say confessed that Jesus Christ was Lord. And so I've been on this Christian journey ever since then. And so today, my friends, do you have that day? Again, you might not remember the exact day, date, and time, okay? Uh, my, one of my favorite preachers, if you continue to listen to these sermons, you'll understand is Dr. B.R. Lincoln, an old-fashioned preacher, just simple country preacher. I just enjoy his preaching so much. And I, this is what he used to say. He says, listen, he says, you may not remember the day and the time, he says, but if you are born again, there was a day and there was a time. OK. And then, and then he goes into his story of where he first accepted Christ as his savior. And, and uh, he actually goes to the place where the old country church used to be. It had been torn down and built a new church, but he'll still go out into the woods behind the he used to when he was alive. He would go in behind the woods behind the new church and go to the place and he'd be like, right about here, it's where it was. This is where the, the, the altar was. This is where I knelt and, and asked Christ to be my savior. But it doesn't matter where, you know, as I said, I was on the front steps of my dad's house. Uh, you might have been in church and knelt at an altar. You could have been in a Sunday school classroom. It could have been uh, a mom or a grandma leading you to the Lord in, in your bedroom. You could have been driving down to the down the road, listening to old Billy Graham on the radio. It doesn't matter where. OK, uh, God's there to meet us. He's asking the same question to you today. Who do you say that I, Jesus, am? Who is he to you today? Answer that question. It's important. If you know that Jesus is Lord, then we have a work to do. We have something that he has us to do, and that's to build his church. And that's what we want to focus on this morning is building the church of God, doing that thing that God would have us to do. And that's what he's trying to get across to his disciples. And so that's the next thing that he says uh, when, it, when Peter responds and, and said that he gave the right answer. Basically, he gave him a quiz and he gave the right answer. Peter answered correctly. Yay, you get 100 percent, Peter. You get an A for on the test today. But when he says that you are the Christ, uh, the Son of God, uh, that was that was a, a good answer uh, to him. And Jesus said unto him, blessed are you, Simon uh, Barjona. OK, he calls him by his surname, Simon. That's what he was known more for by at that time. And he tells me, he says, listen, Peter, or Simon, he says, uh, this wasn't revealed to you by flesh and blood. You didn't learn this from people. You didn't learn this from a book. You know, this wasn't passed on from generation. He says this was revealed to you by God, the father himself. And that's true in all of our lives. You know, I look back at my own salvation and God was doing a work in my life. He was using different things to bring me to that place that I did accept Christ as my savior. Uh, different people that were you know, praying for me, different people that gave me books to read and tracks to read and encouraged me to go to church and just different things. I didn't know it at the time. I didn't see it at the time. But as I look back upon it now, I can see what God was doing. God was drawing me to him. And the other verse I started to read just a little bit ago in John 6, it says, no man can come Unto me, except the Father, which hath sent me, draw him. And that's what God does. That's what Jesus is alluding to here. And today I dare say that God is drawing people to him. That's what he's doing. God is in the business through the power of his Holy Spirit. He is drawing people to himself. Uh, first, to that place of salvation that they'll get saved. But then even beyond that, God is drawing us into a closer walk with him, into a, a relationship with him in, in, in everything that we do in our lives, in our work, in our marriage, and, and just in our recreation. Although I guess we're not allowed to recreate that much. They do encourage you to get out and walk, so get out and walk. But anyway, uh, God is drawing us into a walk and a relationship with him, and that comes from him. Again, do you believe that today? Do you believe that God is working in your life? Sometimes maybe we don't we don't see it happening. You know, we don't see these things going on. But as we can as we go through life and as we can look back, we're like, oh, yeah, I guess God was there. God was working in my life and he was doing a thing. Now, how awesome that is to know that that God is working in your lives. And so look for those little things. Look for those little I don't really want to call them signs, but look for those little things to see what it is that God is doing. 
perhaps he'll send someone in your life, a person in your path that uh, that will be a, a, a source of wisdom, help, hope, encouragement, guidance, whatever, you know, or maybe just an event will take place that kind of gets, gets your attention or maybe even your daily devotions because you're all doing your daily devotions, right? Amen. You're all in your Bibles every day praying. I know you are, right? Okay. And so maybe even in your daily devotions, uh, you know, something will speak to your heart. So, but God is doing that. And he says, blessed are you, Simon, for God has revealed this to you. And God is revealing things in our lives as well. After we get saved, he continues to guide us. He continues to direct us into a, into a walk and a relationship with him for the purpose of us doing something, you know, for us doing the work that needs to be done. This isn't just preachers and missionaries and evangelists doing this work. It's all of us working together, everyone doing their part to, to build the church, uh, to help God's church grow in this world that we live today. And so that's the, the next thing we need to understand. He says, blessed are you, for God has revealed this to you, uh, Simon Barjona. And then he tells him this little story. He says, he says, and also I say unto thee, he says, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And upon this rock, what is that? And, and the answer to this is key. There's a lot of theories and philosophies on what that means. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Uh, many have thought throughout the generations that he was talking to Peter specifically. They'll say that Peter's name means rock. And I'll look at that in just a second. They'll say that Peter's name means rock. And so he's building the church upon Peter. But let's think about that for a second. You know, something as holy and righteous and true as the church of God, uh, I don't believe would be built upon a fallible, sin, sinful man. I don't believe that's what God's saying, and most people don't believe that today. God would not build his church upon a man, okay? He just wouldn't do that. Uh, Peter was not a perfect. Eventually, Peter ends up denying the Lord Jesus Christ three times uh, before Jesus' crucifixion, okay? And so, in reality, what Peter's name truly means, excuse me, <coughs> I still got a tickle, <coughs> and uh, is stone which is a part of a rock, okay? And so, Peter, you are a stone. I heard one preacher say at one time, kind of like a pebble, okay? You are a stone or a pebble, a little rock, okay? You're not the big rock. You're not the rock, okay? It's kind of like he's saying to Peter, you're Peter, okay? He gives him a name. That's kind of where his name changes. God's doing a work in his life, and a lot of times when God does it, they'll, they'll do a name, name change. And so, you're no longer Simon. You're now Peter, okay? You are a little stone, and then he says, upon this rock, well, what is the rock? Two ways you can look at this, okay? Um, some people say that it's upon that confession that Peter made, that Jesus is the Christ, that he was the Son of God. And that is important because that's what his church should be built upon, okay, is upon that confession. Not just Jesus and himself, but that the fact that Jesus is the very Son of God, that he was the Christ, the Messiah, that one that was prof prophesied, that was promised in the Old Testament, and then revealed in the New Testament, uh, that he would die upon the cross to pay the price for our sins. But more specifically, he was saying, listen, upon this rock, meaning himself, Jesus is that rock, the Bible tells us. 1 Corinthians 10, 4, it says that rock was Christ. Okay, comes around, comes around, tells us the rock is Jesus. We sing about songs like that, you know, about the rock. Uh, Ephesians two twenty, it says, it says that you and I, we are built upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, and Jesus Christ Himself being what that chief cornerstone. That's who He is. He is the rock. He is the chief cornerstone upon which our church is built. He is that foundation. Okay, Jesus Christ, and the confession that Jesus is the Christ, that one that would come to take away. Of the church. And so our church is not built upon a fallible man or anything like that of any nature. It's built upon Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. He is the one that, that has founded this church. Okay. And so it's important to us to understand that when he says upon this rock, he's referring to himself and that confession that he was the Christ. That's what our church is built upon. And it's key. You know, I, I, I you've heard me say this before. I truly don't care what denomination or what religion or what background anyone belongs to. It does not matter to me one bit whatsoever. It used to. There was a time that it did. But anymore, it doesn't so much matter to me what your religion is, okay? What I want to know is what do you think about Jesus? Who is Jesus? And we go back to that same question. Who is the Christ? Who is Jesus to you? Is he that virgin-born son of God, perfect and infallible, that one that died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. He died, rose again, showed himself alive, the Bible says, by many infallible proofs, has sent it up into the heavens. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father right now, and he's offering salvation to anyone who will accept him today. That's Jesus. That's what the key to the church is all about, okay? And so do you know that today, that rock? 
which is Jesus Christ. That's what's important. Okay. And so from that, <clears throat> this is what he wants to build his church. And so how does God build that church? Well, he builds it through us. Even as that last verse that I, that I read, we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and, and the prophets. You know, that work that God was doing in the prophets and then in the disciples or the apostles. And now he's doing that work in us. We're continuing their work. The foundation is still Jesus, but we are the one that is continuing this work uh, that was started in them. And we'll pass that on. If Jesus should tarry his coming and not come back in our lifetime, which I kind of think he will, but um, then we're passing this on to the next generation, passing our faith along and, and this foundation along to that next generation so that we can build that church. And Peter got it. He, he truly did. Eventually he did get it again. As I said, he denied the Lord and then he wept bitterly and he came back and then he was instrumental in the, in the early foundation of the church and the book of Acts. We know that Peter um, preached on the day of Pentecost and more than 5,000 souls got saved. And so God used him in a big way. Uh, but in one of his epistles and one of his letters that he wrote, Peter says this in, in 1 Peter 2, 5, he says, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. And Peter, again, I believe when he writes this, is referencing to what the Lord told him here before Jesus went to the cross. He says, listen, we are living stones. That's what some of the newer translations say. The King James says lively stones, but that's what it means. We are living stones. We are a part of that rock. We are a part of the church. You know, we have been uh, built in. You know, we're part of one of the, the bricks that's built into the, the, the structure of the church. Jesus is that foundation, but we are lively stones, living stones, a part of that. And we all have a part in building the church of God, no matter what our part may be. <clears throat> Sometimes we think, well, preachers have a big part. No, not necessarily. Okay, We all just have a part and no part is more important than the other. You know, the Bible uses the illustration of a body, whether you're a finger or a toe or a knee or whatever, you know, it just doesn't matter. Each part is important and no part is more important than the other. We all are parts that are fitly joined together doing uh, the work that needs to be done. We all have our part as living stones to build the church of God. You say, well, preacher, what can I do to help build the church of God? Well, number one, build yourself. You know, Make sure that you are that Christian that God would have you to be, uh, that you're praying, that you're reading your Bible, that you're going to church when you can, you know kind of limited in that area today, but, you know, uh, but do those simple things. Those are just simple things that anyone can do. And there's very little hindrance to those things. There's very little, anything to stop you from do that. But then, you know, be kind as the Bible says, love one another, you know, love your neighbors and, 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 and sinners, you know, try to help people, to, but to be kind to one another and do things for other people, do those good deeds. The Bible says we are his workmanship created unto good works, doing those things. But certainly invite people to church. Tell people about Jesus. Encourage them. You know, as I said, God was drawing me to a place of salvation. Well, God used people, people that talked to me, people that gave me books and tracts and invited me to church. And eventually got through this thick head and I went to church and I got saved. I accepted Christ as my Savior. It took a while. Very few people actually get saved the very first time they hear the gospel. It takes a while. It takes few people to, to say some things and to guide us and help us and get us to that place. And we can all be a part of that. You can be a part of that just by loving people and caring about people and praying for people. You know, I've, I've encouraged folks in my church all the time that we should be praying for five people at all times. Five people that we know, family, friends, loved, loved ones, coworkers, whatever, that are lost, that don't know Jesus. You pray for them. Just lift their name up in prayer before God every day, praying that they'll ask Christ as their Savior. Okay, you do that today. You know, and if, you, if, if five's too many, that's fine. At least get one. One person that you're concerned about for their salvation and that you're going to pray for them and lift them up to the Lord and, and then ask God to use you to be an avenue or a tool to bring that person to a saving knowledge. But we can build the church of God. Not just build it in numbers, you know, souls being saved, but then building the church itself and encouraging one another. You know, lifting our brothers up, that one that is discouraged, will you be there to help them? Uh, maybe that one that's gotten off track, encourage them to get back where they need to be. Don't judge. You know, don't don't judge their sin just because it's different than your sin. Huh? Amen. OK, but encourage people to, to be in walk in fellowship with him. But that's what the Lord is doing today. He is building his church and he's using all of us. We are building this thing together. That's what he wants us to do. He says, he says, you're Peter, you're a lively stone, a living stone. You're a part of this. But he says, upon this rock, this rock is Jesus. He says, I will build my church. That's what God says. I'm going to build my church. It's going to happen. You think you'll be a part of it and enjoy all the joys and blessings and, and, and great hallelujahs that come with it, or you can miss out. And so many people today are missing out because they don't, they're not a part of the, the church or the family of God. Come, 
be a part of this. Be a part of what God is doing in this world. This is a great world that we live. It's a great time to be a child of God and to be in church. God is doing great things. Souls are still being saved. People are still surrendering their lives to the Lord. Missionaries are going to the far-flung reaches of the world, preaching the gospel. And God is still doing a thing in this world today. Be a part of it. You know, help in, in the building process of this church of God. Next thing he says, then he says that, 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 that the gates of hell shall not prevail against me, against the church. <clears throat> in Bible days, many cities were walled in cities and they had gates. And the gates, of course, were where you would come and go through a city. But that gate represented power and authority. Uh, many of uh, town hall meetings were held at the gate. A gate wasn't just a gate. There was usually like gatehouses on either side, places, rooms where you could congregate. Uh, in, 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 and this was the place where people would either come or pass or not be allowed to come in. But it was a place of power and authority. That's what the gate, gate represented. Uh, we're referred to as a sheepfold. The Christian church is referred to a sheepfold. And, and our gate is Jesus. He's the one that allows people to come and go. And it's it, without Christ, you cannot be a part of the family of God. And so that gate represents authority and power. And so the gates of hell represent the power of hell. hell. And Jesus says, listen. Uh, the gates of hell, that power and authority is nothing in comparison to my power, my authority. When Jesus paid the price, when he went to the cross and died on the cross, he won the victory for you and I. He destroyed the gates of hell, if you will. And so that now today, anyone who trusts in Christ, we don't have to spend eternity in hell. Okay, But instead, we can spend eternity in heaven by simply believing. In the Old Testament, people look forward to the coming of the Messiah. He hadn't come yet, and so their faith was placed forward, looking to that Messiah, that one that would come to redeem the world. Now, today, you and I, we look back. Our faith goes back, looking back to Jesus, the Christ, who came and died on the cross. And so our faith has always been, whether Old Testament or New Testament, looking to Jesus, that chief cornerstone. That one that is the foundation of our church today. And his promise today is that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of God. We have the victory in Jesus. We can and will win this thing. In case you hadn't looked, you know, I, I cheated. I went and read the last book in the book of Revelation. And guess what? We win. When this thing's all done, we're going to be in glory with him. If you know Jesus Christ is your, today, your Savior today, you'll be in glory with God. When God ushers in the new heaven and the new earth and the new kingdom, we'll be a part of that. Jesus says in John 14, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. It's a promise from God. When Jesus was dying on the cross, there was two thieves, one on either side. One cursed him, said, if you be Lord, get us down out of here. But the other one said, hush. He says, we belong here. He don't. He is a righteous man. And Jesus turned to him and he says, listen, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. And that thief that day when he died, he went to heaven to be with Jesus Christ. My friends, today, that's what we can know. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Jesus Christ won that victory for you and I today. The Bible says in Isaiah 54, no weapon, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Nothing can defeat us. Nothing can beat us. The gates of hell will not prevail. You know, whatever, I, you know, I don't know what you're struggling with today. Maybe you're struggling with a sin or some kind of temptation in your life, or maybe it's worry or discouragement. Maybe you're all worried about what's going on in our culture and our world today with this coronavirus, okay? God can give you the victory over that. He can give you peace in your heart. He can help you to overcome anything that you're facing, any sin, any trial, any temptation, any decision that you need to make right now. He'll give you the victory. The gates of hell shall not prevail against you today. You can and will have the victory in Jesus Christ. He is that rock. He is that foundation. He is that one that will give us exactly what we need today. Do you believe that? The key goes back to our first question. Who do you say that I, the son of man, am? Okay, very important. The gates of hell shall not prevail. And then the last thing he says, and I give to you the keys. What is he talking about? Well, if you go into the book of Revelation, it says that Jesus goes down and he gets those keys. I like to joke in church, you know, that when Jesus died on the cross and he was buried in the tomb, he went down to the depths of hell and he took the keys from Satan, poked him in the eyes. Probably didn't. But I like to say that. <laughs> but anyway, but he took those keys from Satan. He got them. The Bible says in Revelation 1.18, he says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And he says, and I have the keys of hell and of death. That's what he says. Revelation 1.18. Jesus got the keys. And he was promised them here in our text in Matthew 16. He says, I will, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Okay. That's what he did. He went down and he got those keys. 
And so today, you and I have the keys. It's like the keys of the city. The keys of the city, you can go and do anything you want because you got the keys of the city. Well, we got the keys of the kingdom. This is what I give them to you. What does that mean specifically? You know, you might ask that question. He says, whatever you bind in heaven or bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Folks, listen, we have the power to tell people about Jesus, to invite them to church, to bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ, to help them, to encourage them, to lift them up, to build them up, to do the work, to build a church. That's what he's saying. That's what those keys are. He's given us everything we need. We have the Bible, the Holy Scriptures that we can learn and know him, know him better so that we can tell others about him. We have the Scriptures. We have the power of prayer. Praying for people that are lost. Praying for people that need Jesus as Savior. Praying for people that have gone astray. As the old preachers would say, people that are backslidden. You know, we can help them. We can be an encouragement. And this is, be careful. He says, be careful when you judge somebody about a splinter in their eye, because you might have a beam in your eye, a moat in your eyes, it says, okay? Make sure your hand, make sure you're right. And do encourage one another. Help them. And so these are the keys that he's talking about, that we can help to build his church, to grow it up to make a difference in the hearts and lives of others. Are you making the people around you better? Is that what we're doing? Are we building people up or are we tearing people down? You know, it's always so fun to say a sharp little thing, a little quip, and I'm just as guilty as the next guy. Listen, I, I yell at myself all the time. I shouldn't be like that, I know. No, but you get around people and you, you little digs and stuff like that. We, sh- we really shouldn't be like that. We really shouldn't be that way. We should in- instead be finding ways to encourage our brothers and sisters, encouraging those ones that are down and out and, and discouraged, if you will. Okay. And so those keys, uh, my friends today, we need to start opening some doors. That's all there is to it. Take them keys and working in the hearts and lives of other people, working in family and friends and, and loved ones and just coworkers and people you meet anywhere. <clears throat> Do you believe these things today? Jesus Christ says, listen, I'm going to build my church. I want you to be a part of it. I want you to be a part of it. I'm going to give you the keys. One thing I didn't talk about, the, the, the keys, which, yeah, we have the Bible. We have prayer. But we also have the power of the Holy Spirit. When we get saved, when Christ saves our souls, the Bible says that we become a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God comes and lives and dwells inside of us. He seals us. Until that day of redemption, we can't lose our salvation. It belongs to us. It's not going to go away. That's what that Holy Spirit, he seals us just like you would seal a a jar of preserves or something like that. Or sealed by that Holy Spirit. But that Holy Spirit also empowers us. It guides us in our thoughts and in our words. It teaches us what we should say, what we should do. That Holy Spirit is an awesome power that we have today to do the work of God. And so listen to it. You know, whether you want to think of it as a conscience inside of you or something inside your heart, but God is doing a thing in your life. And so if he says, hey, listen, I want you to say something nice to that person. I want you to do something nice for that person. Don't ignore that. Don't quench the spirit, the Bible says. Do those things. Be the hands and feet of Jesus today in this world. Help to build the church. Jesus Christ, again, said to Peter, he says, thou art Peter. You are a lively stone, a living stone. And he says, upon this rock, this rock is Jesus. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, sometimes we might look at this world and think, wow, this world, and excuse the saying here, but this world is going to hell in a handbasket. You know, people have said that before, and many Christians feel that way. But friends, listen to me. God is still on his throne, and Jesus is still doing a work in this world today. Do you believe that? God is still building his church. Don't be afraid of what's going on out there in the world. Don't be afraid of it. Don't even concern yourself with it. That's God's fight. That's God's battle. Let him do that. Our work is right in front of us. It's the person that you come in contact as soon as you're done watching this video. Whether it's your wife, your husband, your kids, someone you're going to work with, whatever. That's your next task. That's your homework assignment. Will you take those keys and start opening some doors and doing a work in someone else's life? That's what he wants us to do today. Don't worry about the big picture. Let God handle that. His shoulders are huge. He can handle that. You stop worrying, okay, about what's going on in this world and just start doing the work of God. Jesus says, take my yoke upon me. He says, my burden is easy. That's what he'd have us to do is his work. Will you do that today? All right, let's close in order of prayer. Our God and our Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you again for the power of the Holy Spirit that does rest inside of us. I pray that if there's anyone that's listened to this video today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that they can't take me to that time and that place when they accepted Christ, that they too will be saved today. It really is simple. All it takes is a matter of believing that Jesus is the Christ, that confessing that he is Lord, that he was that virgin-born Son of God. And that he died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. He died, was buried, he rose again, and he ascended up into the the heavens and seated at the right hand of God the Father today. And anyone that will say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins and I ask Jesus to save me. If 
Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It really is that simple. It truly is. <clears throat> and if you've prayed that prayer with me right now, mark this day down. What is today's date? Uh, it's March 29th of 2020. You can write that down, that on this day you accepted Christ as your Savior. And this is your spiritual birthday. You are born again, and you can know that. Now you are filled and sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Father God, today, for those that are saved and already know it, help us, Lord, to start opening some doors, to take those keys and help to build the church of God. And Father God, we're going to thank you. We're going to praise you because I know that you are going to do a great work in the days and weeks and months to come. And Father, we're going to thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Goodbye, folks. Have a good day.